teaching and learning on the go. And with that, let's move on to the webinar at hand today. Thank you for taking the time to join us in this discussion and thank you for being patient as we resolve the technical issues. In designing this and other webinars through the year, the Firki team is hoping that we can disseminate meaningful knowledge and skill that takes us closer to our goal of improving quality education in Indian classrooms. Through this webinar, today's speaker, Ms. Isha Mahatre, will be covering the following. How do we observe and become aware of the microbes around us? Unique traits that classify microbes as fungi, bacteria, and viruses. And identifying and using school projects like the Winogradsky column and evolving STEM for teachers to implement similar strategies to introduce microbes to school children. With that, uh, let us begin today's webinar with an introduction to our speaker for the evening. Isha is a microbiologist and she has done her PhD in microbiology from Friedrich Schiller University of Jena. She is currently a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Pittsburgh, where she studies bacterial evolution and adaptation to biofilm, which is a multicellular lifestyle. She further aims to pursue a career in academia researching on metabolism and interactions of bacteria in natural environments. This brings us to the norms of the webinar today. Till 6.15, our speaker will share her presentation. After 6.15, we will be taking questions. Given the number of audience that we are expecting today, please keep your video and mic off to reduce the stress on the bandwidth. Unmute it only when our speaker is taking questions and comments. To ask questions or clarify anything, please write in the chat box. I will be there to curate your questions and comments throughout the webinar. We will take them collectively at the end during the open space. Do remember that learning new things is often difficult, but challenge yourself and reflect on your thinking and experiences today. The best way to remember something is to write it or discuss your learning with someone after the webinar. We also have Prerna from our implementation team who is taking notes, a summary of which will be sent to you after the webinar. We will have multiple opportunities to interact with our speaker throughout the call. Free, feel free to post questions in the chat window throughout the call. And Ms. Matre will try and get through as many questions as possible in the last 15 minutes of the webinar. The webinar will be recorded and will be available to you on YouTube and on the Firgi website soon. This brings me to an end of my introduction. Thank you for your patience and hope you have an interesting evening. Over to you now, Isha. Hi. Um, thank you so much, Pranati, for this awesome introduction and also uh, organizing this uh, Firki guys, the whole team of Firki. And hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining this uh, beautiful uh, webinar. I call it beautiful webinar because I really love microbes. I've been studying them for 11 years of my life now. And so I'm really happy to share some of what microbes are with you guys. So here's my, I'm sharing my presentation. Okay, I just want you guys to confirm that you can see the slides. Can you guys see the slides? Okay, good. Okay. So microbes, um, we don't, I know that school children uh, in schools, they, we don't study much about microbes, but um, we study them or not, they are all around us and our survival actually depends on microbes. They are everywhere in soil, air, water, and also on our skin. So why does our survival depend upon us? Because microbes play a vital role in, uh, the, on the planet and making it a livable planet for us. And the only planet that we know can sustain us. So what they do is they uh, do cause diseases, but at the same time, they also are very important. And uh, they are usually in textbooks known as decomposers. So when plants or animals die, they decay, and these decomposers act upon them, turning them into fossils or organic matter. But more than decomposers, they form a vital... Can you, can you hear me properly? Okay. So they form a vital link between 
uh, what the resources that plants and animals utilize and then cycling them back to the environment. So as you see, this is called as biogeochemical cycle where plants and producers and composers, consumers take up the useful elements from the environment and decomposers help to cycle them back to the environment. And this biogeochemical cycles are important link to the climate changes that we see in today's uh, environment. And sometimes microbes can have very essential answers to how we can combat climate change or hazards of climate uh, change that we are facing today. So if you want to know more about biogeochemical cycles, you can, there, is, there are a lot of articles, very useful articles on internet and or you can ask me more questions about that later. Secondly, microbes are also very much part of our body and they help us digest our food. Also, some vitamins that are very essential for our body growth are produced by microbes from the food that we eat. Our body cells do not produce vitamins. Microbes are therefore essential to produce these vitamins in our body. And you might have heard about gut microbiome. And yes, so gut microbiome are really essential for digestion and uh, energy um, uh, consumption of, from the food and uh, passing them to the organelles or different organs of our body. And also like plants and animals, they form a unique uh, layer over them. So as you can see here, here is a plant root and then there is a fluorescent bacteria which is made fluorescent in order to visualize it properly. And as you can see, it forms a very uh, hard layer around the root. And this itself tells us that it is present all over. And this is a useful bacteria. So it can, kind of uh, combats or uh, uh, protects plants from pests and other pathogens that could uh, be harmful for the plant. Likewise, even on our skin, they form a protective barrier. And with our immune system, they help to combat co disease-causing agents. So these useful microbes, how do we observe them? So in a laboratory or in a microbiology lab or research centers, they're usually observed under a microscope or they are used um, uh, and grown as these communities. And these communities are called as colonies. Uh, I'm going to refer to this colony uh, elsewhere when I'm going to talk about one of the practical uh, tasks that you can do in schools. So please remember what is a colony? Colony is a community of microbes. So microbes are very microscopic, right? But these single cells, they divide and form these clusters and therefore you can see a visible colony that is grown on a solid surface. Apart from microbiology lab, you still observe microbes in our day-to-day -day life. Something like um, kitchen science, which is curdling of milk, uh, something that is done in every Indian household and something that is part of classical microbiology. So what is classical microbiology is, just inoculating or introducing microbes to a new environment. And that is what we do when you make curd, right? You, you use previous curd in a new batch of milk and then allow it to set. And what you are using in form of previous curd is nothing but bacteria that then get introduced to the milk and they start utilizing the lactose in the milk and form acids and therefore you get curd. Likewise, you see sometimes that your bread or maybe even chapati gets a black mold on it. And after you see that, you just throw it away. But if you are a curious person, maybe you can take a magnifying glass next time and observe that what are these black structures and how are they formed. And closely observing them, you might see that they are hair-like structures and they, are, they have some beautiful morphology. Of course, they are not very black. They are sometimes green or even sometimes white. Um, and so this is something is what is called as bread mold and it's a fun fungus. And there is also uh, uh, on our ponds, you see this mossy layer and this mossy layer is formed by single cell, uh, single cells that also have chlorophyll in them. A chlorophyll allows cells to utilize sunlight and make carbon 
uh, out, out of it and give out oxygen, something that also plants do and a process called as photosynthesis. And this, these are microscopic algae who do that. Okay. So um, I'm going to talk more about how to differentiate them. So now we saw that we have curd and we have bacteria in curd. You have bread mold, but also our garden mushrooms are part of fungus. But what are these other three types? So I already mentioned algae. Algae are like uh, plants, but microscopic plants because they have chlorophyll in them and can do photosynthesis. And protists are like microscopic animals. They eat other microscopic beings like bacteria and also other protists sometimes. And then you have your viruses that cause common cold and something that we know that virus always causes disease. And so these are five main groups, how microorganisms are classified as. The main difference between these five are that, so what differentiates between living and non-living being is presence of genetic material. So we as living beings have genetic material. A stone does not have a genetic material. So a virus is a simplest form of living being where the genetic material is covered by a envelope and that's it that's how viruses are next bacteria are a step further a genetic material is not only covered by a envelope but the envelope is also very rigid and has certain hair like structures on them and also certain proteins on them that help them take up things from outside environment and give out things from inside environment of the cell. And these hair-like structures help them to swim in the, in the environment that they uh, occur in. So they can swim in your uh, uh, gut, they can swim in your water, they can swim in your milk. So that, that is what, what hair-like structure helps them do. Fungi, on the other hand, have well-defined structures. As you can see closely, a mushroom has a stalk or a stem, and then it has this upper body. Usually, if you see a bread mold, you will also see such structures on the bread mold. You will see hair-like structures, which are the stem or stalks, and then you have an upper body. This upper body contains spores, something called as spores. Spores are nothing but seeds. Plants have seeds. When seeds are um, uh, go to a new environment, they germinate and form other plants, right? So fungi also have spores that are thrown in the air and they form other environments or other surfaces to catch and germinate or grow on. Likewise, algae, as I said, they have chlorophyll inside them. They are minute microscopic cells and protists are uh, uh, like uh, 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 microscopic animals. Something that differentiate these two from the other uh, uh, simple uh, microorganisms is that they also have other organelles like mitochondria, like just our cells. Um, our cells are also microscopic, but they are still a higher form of organism, organism on this planet. So this is how we differentiate these five categories. So now we are going to do a fun game. I'm going to ask you guys to answer some questions and probably identify which kind of microorganism is present in that particular environment. And you can answer your uh, thing on the chat and uh, maybe Pr uh, Pranati will help us uh, uh, check what you answer. And let's see uh, who answers, uh, how, how, if you can answer this correctly. Okay, one more thing which I forgot, that how to observe them. Mostly you use microscopes to observe them, but for certain higher organisms, you can also use magnifying glass. So next time you see a micro, you have to first see if you can see it from a microscope, for magnifying glass or not, like fungi or algae. You can easily see with, micros uh, with magnifying glass. Okay, so now time for trivia. Now this boy has chicken pox. What kind of microbe do you think causes chicken pox? Any ideas? Guys, you can okay. just type your answers in the chat box or yeah, if you want. I'm, I'm getting some answers, but I'll give you one, like few seconds more. Okay. 
great. Most people are saying okay, viral. Yeah, so most people are very correct. It is caused by virus. Yeah. <laughs> Guys, please feel free to share your responses uh, by unmuting yourself on the mic in case you're not uh, able to chat. Uh, on the yeah, that will also be fine. So now the second question, which group does amoeba belong to? Now amoeba is a organism that we, we say that we all have evolved from amoeba. Which group does amoeba belong to? That's protistas, isn't it? Protistas? Yes. Hello. Yes, yes, you're right. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah, so protozoa is part of protists and amoeba is also part of protists and amoeba belongs to the group protists. The third question, you want to bake a cake, what will you add? What organism will you add in the cake? To bacteria. Bake. Uh, bacteria? That's east. No. Fungi. Yes, east. and east is east. what? It's a fungi. Correct. So you yeah. add yeast in order to bake your cake because it, uh, it uh, helps your cake to rise and it belongs to group fung fungus. So yay! So most of you have answered this correctly. And now we go on to certain practical uh, tasks that you can do in school. Uh, so how do you culture microbes? I know you come from uh, different backgrounds of the schools and I uh, understand that the schools do not have um, uh, sometimes uh, grants or uh, monies to uh, sponsor certain techniques like microbiology techniques which involve a petri plate. This is called a petri dish and we have a semi-solid uh, surface on it just like a jelly and you culture it uh, on, on this normally. And after growing, it takes about a day or two for microbes to form these structures, like I said before, colonies. So what you can do in order to do this at school level? And the other reason why this is not also a practical thing to use at the school, because uh, these are higher uh, study techniques and sometimes eighth graders are too small to actually deal with such colonies but they can deal with friendly microbes like microbes around us on our hand on our mobile phone on our pen on in soil uh, wherever they want they can they can find what microbes uh, grow and so the easiest way you can do is take a jelly packet and while making the jelly put it in the container a container that that is uh, that is uh, that has a wider surface would be useful once the jelly is set, what you can do is you can take samples from soil, skin, mobile phone, some, some objects that you use normally and you're interested in. There was an interesting question uh, that someone asked that what are the microbes that are in landfills? So maybe if you're curious, you can also get a sample from there. And these are samples are there out in, in, your, in, in your environment. So I don't think they are harmful. Uh, they, are, they are very harmful for children to even use. And give it a day or two. And you will see these beautiful structures that develop. And maybe this is something that you can do at school level to, to improve microbes. Children. Um, are there any questions? I can hear some people speaking. I had a question actually. Could you explain okay. a little bit to people who might be how do you transfer these samples from different uh, uh, sources, oh, um, soil or your skin? How do you transfer them onto the jelly plate uh, if they are doing it in school? Okay, yeah, very good question. So uh, normally what I would do to transfer soil, I would just maybe put soil and dissolve it in water and then um, uh, take some drops and put it on the jelly for it to grow. And that is enough. When you have objects, I think the objects are best stamped. So if it is a hand and a jelly, I can just stamp the hand on the jelly, just like this person must have done to get this, no, this nice pattern of hands and hand microbes that are there on, probably are growing on his hand at that particular instant. 
So this is how you can uh, introduce it on, on the jelly. Uh, so it's, it's basically just, just putting uh, microbes or introducing microbes to this particular uh, jelly um, uh, kind of petri plate or a dish that you have created. And you can, you can take samples from anywhere. You can take water samples. For example, if you want to see if your, if your drinking water has some really bad looking microbes, you can, you can do that as well. I know um, it is a very bit risky. Maybe you won't want to drink that water later. So it is, it is up to teachers to decide what samples to, um, to, to uh, find um, things from. But I think hands and uh, the useful, uh, usual objects that we use are very interesting objects. And these are microbes that live with us. They are our microbiome. So they are not harmful. It's only that uh, they will, they will be, uh, it will be possible for you to see them in, in form of these. And sometimes it might uh, make people very aware or people feel very dirty about things. And it is also a, another good way to introduce sanitation in schools, like why you need to wash your hands before eating or before um, doing some, some important things and why cleanliness is important. Okay, so now we start with new uh, other uh, technique that I would want to introduce. It's called Hi, can I ask a question real quick. Yeah, yeah, sure, please. Hi. So I'm really interested in doing the jelly in a container experiment in my classroom. Um, yeah. One of the questions I had was uh, when we grow microbes in a laboratory. Um, yeah. We grow it on media like agar agar. Um, yeah. It has um, a blend of nutrition uh, yeah. that the um, bacteria can take from. Does yeah. just gelatin in water, is it enough of a composition to have microbes grow? Or do I also need to include something like sugar in the mixture or something? Do you have like suggestions? Yeah. Uh, so why I consider jelly here, so I'm not considering gelatin. So of course, if I would have said gelatin, then I would add sugar, as you said. But uh, I am sure that gelatin is not available everywhere. But what is available in grocery stores is maybe jelly making packets that already have sugar in them. Okay. So, you know, you make jelly for cakes or jelly for candies, yeah. right? So uh, maybe not, people are not aware of gelatin, but they might be aware of jelly. Okay. And so okay. I introduced jelly, which already has sugar. So that's enough for them to grow. But if you are using gelatin, of course, you add sugar um, and salt okay. for microbes to grow. Okay. And that is like a home-based agar. Okay. All right. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah? Yeah. Okay. So Vinogradsky column is another, uh, uh, it's nothing but a replica of a pond system. What happens in pond, you get it and uh, set it up in your, uh, in, a, in, a, in a place, uh, in, a, in your school backyard or even in your house sometimes. So it's nothing but a cylindrical uh, structure where you fill it with mud uh, so that you have a difference in oxygen and also difference in sulfate. I, I'll come in, uh, I, I'll briefly go through it uh, all over again with this link. So what you do is you just take a cylinder surface, fill it with mud, and then with any kind of water, you can use pond water or rain water, or even your uh, uh, drinking reservoir water. So I'm going to go to this link. Okay, uh, do you see this link? Is this link uh, possible? I mean, do you see this link? Just do a thumbs up. Okay. So this is a link that is attached to the presentation. So when you have this presentation, you can use this link to go through this particular website. It is called Make a Home for Microbe. And this is called a Vinogradsky column. And your children, same uh, like, like, like seven or eight graders are even, even smaller are doing this technique where they take a cylindrical bottle. You can use the soft drink bottle or sometimes you can also use glass bottle and you can mark. There are two markings that they do. Okay. So one marking is for a basal layer. Normally your basal layer should contain cellulose and carbonates and sulfates and they come from egg shells, paper and lots of uh, uh, mud, this thick mud. And so that's what they are doing. They are using paper and eggshells and making this first basal layer. Next, they are using normal garden soil to add up to the second layer, second mark that they made. 
and then they are using garden uh, pond water or you can also use rain water it depends on which kind of water you use what kind of colors you see in this column and once you add the water you close this particular container with a muslin cloth in order to allow the aeration so this is how the column looks you can live it next to the window for 8 to 10 weeks sometimes even for months like 6 months or so to observe colors that happen in the in the in the uh, in this particular container so what happens here is the way it is formed you have air co going coming from uh, uh, the top and therefore as you go bottom the uh, oxygen goes on decreasing whereas sulfate concentration goes on uh, increasing as you go towards bottom the best thing about this site is that you can click on these uh, blue dots and you can know what uh, bacteria what kind of bacteria are grown in each layer so this site is really useful for that you can know what is what in each layer and this is how you can make a vinogradsky column okay back to the presentation after Isha, eight minutes sorry to interrupt you uh, you have about 15 minutes more left before we can start taking the questions just giving your time check it's about okay five. no worries no worries i have another one slide left so don't worry thanks okay so uh, i just wanted to say that after 8 to 10 weeks this is how your bottles or vinokratsky column would look uh, depending on what is your water source what is your mer source there are different kinds of colors that you can see so this activity can be done in groups and each group takes uh, mud and water source from different locations and then you can see what are the different uh, colors that are formed and this is also a kind of replica of a of a pond of course in our ponds and lakes we don't see them uh, enhance see these enhanced colors but then there is a lake in yellowstone national park where you can act, because it has higher sulfur you can actually see these colors um, in broad daylight with your eyes uh, at the lakes uh, at the lake surface so this is a vinogradsky column if you want to know uh, what happens and how microbes grow and these colors are formed because of microbes you have purple sulfur bacteria you have green sulfur bacteria you have cyanobacteria that make all these colors and layers form these layers in this vinogradsky column uh you can ask me questions later about this and this is a small experiment that uh, is being carried out in high schools of united states uh, specifically in pittsburgh uh, and it is, it is an initiative by dr von cooper he also is one of my supervisors uh, under uh, uh, whom i am doing my postdoctoral research so you can ask me more in details about this particular experiment if interested but i'm going to quickly go through what this experiment is about this experiment is a is a, a way to use microbes as model to study evolution now evolution is where how you evolve from your ancestors right but why microbes are very useful in do, in studying questions about evolution is they grow faster a, a microbial cell can divide in 20 minutes sometimes depending on species they can take a day to divide but this is still faster than what what we as organisms do so uh, they can grow faster they can form large population sizes in a confined place and therefore they are easy to handle the best other quality of microbes is that they can be frozen and thus can be revived again and this is something not possible uh, i mean i know there are sci-fi movies that have been talking about freezing or making humans to sleep freezing them and then waking them in 10 years but practically it's not possible right now on this planet but what is possible this is this is possible with microbes and so you can do these experiments this generation of experiments with microbes so, so this particular evolving stem uh, uh, protocol involves growing microbes so what we do is we have this tube uh, we have this medium that that is nutrient medium for microbes to use you can use any medium like milk or even a laboratory confined defined medium and you add microbes to it okay and then you have a bead in 24 hours microbes grow in large numbers and they also attach to the bead and this is the bead that we take out from the environment and introduce to a new environment 
and this is called as microbial evolution model. So we introduce it to a new environment containing another different color bead. And we go on doing this until say day, day six or so. So from day one to day six, you already have like around 60 generations, like, you know, approximately counting six generations per day. You have 60 generations just in a week. And just imagine this is your ancestor population, right? You can freeze it and you can also freeze your day six population. And then you, you can revive it on a particular day and see what is the difference between these two. So what you can see is this is your ancestor and this is how the ancestor colony would look like. Whereas your evolved colonies or evolved population looks like this. It, 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 it makes different characterization. It, it looks different from the ancestor. And this is nothing but a diversification. Something that actually happened throughout, uh, is actually happening throughout the years on this planet. You diversify into new species. Okay, so this is, a, this is not a diversification into new species when I'm talking about bacteria. This is just diversification within the species, just like what is happening in these birds. These, these are called as Darwin's finches. What Darwin observed is that this particular bird, when it went to, when it diversified into different environments, it started using different food source. And because of the different food source it used, it developed a different kind of beak, but it remained same species. So this is called as diversification. And this is what we see in microbes. And diversification is an important step for studying evolution and observing diversification in a weak time in a classroom is a very unique concept. And I think uh, if, if someone, people are interested, they can do this um, uh, in a large set, set. And if you have any questions, you can, you can ask me these questions. I hope I'm clear with this. I know there might be many questions on this slide. Uh, I'm ready to answer them. And if you have any questions, even later after uh, this webinar, I will be happy to answer them. Uh, so just uh, to end, uh, I'm just going to answer some basic questions for students. How you can be a microbiologist, the basic step is to do a bachelor degree in either microbiology, biotechnology, or biochemistry, or genetics. And once you are in bachelor's uh, uh, college, you would know the next steps, whether you want to do master's, whether you want to go in which line you want to take further. What can you, I mean, what does a microbiologist do? Like what kind of jobs you can do? A, you can be a research scientist, someone like me uh, who works in industry, who can work in industry as well as in academia. You can be a professor and teach and also supervise students like me or PhD students or master students. Um, you can work in industry, mostly like qualitative analyst. Many food industries require people to, to check the quality of food, if it is contaminated or not, if it has higher shelf life or not. And people want uh, these, uh, so companies need these people to check, do this qualitative checks at each step of their production houses. Uh, so these food industries, cosmetic industries, uh, pharma companies do require microbiologists. At the end, you can also work in forensics. You can work as a path lab microbiologist studying the blood samples of the patients. At the same time, you can work as epidemiologist. What epidemiologist is, he's a, uh, he or she is a consultant where they study how epidemics are caused, like how H1N1 virus that, that causes bird flu spreads from a particular location to other parts of location. And these are the studies that an epidemiologist does and gives a report to say a hospital or to a uh, World Health Organization. So this, this is what an epidemiologist does. It's, they study um, how spread, diseases spread and become epidemics. Lastly, uh, how you can get more information about microbes. Um, there are very good institutes in India, two of which I know that uh, let public uh, come and uh, see uh, or even students come as, as field trips or uh, picnics uh, in form of uh, picnic, industrial visit to visit them. And one is Natural, National Institute of Virology in Pune and uh, National Center of Biological Studies in Bangalore, NCBS and NIV. 
I am sure there are other uh, institutes, research institutes in Delhi and everywhere else. Uh, you have JN CSIR in Gujarat. Um, I don't know much of these institutes if they allow public visits, but I'm sure they do. Uh, and if you write to them as a school principal or a school teacher, uh, they would respond to you. That is one way. Or you can host a scientist. Maybe in, in school, the scientist can come and tell more about microbes and their research. Uh, if not, you can also read certain magazines. A school library can subscribe to these magazines. They are Sanctuary Asia, National Geographic, Scientific American, New Scientists. Uh, Sanctuary Asia is one of the Indian uh, magazines. And this is something that I used to read when I was small and that got in me interested into genetics and microbiology. So this is something that school libraries can subscribe to if they want to know. And that's it from me. Uh, I'm ready for the questions now. Thanks so much, Isha. Uh, so if any of y'all have any questions, uh, unmute yourself and ask the questions or even uh, ask them in the chat window. Uh, we'll wait a few oh. seconds to see. I'm sorry, wait, um, I just have to, I can't see the chat window. Yeah, that's okay, Isha, I'll read out the questions to you if any count. In okay. addition to that, we have quite a few questions that we got in our registration forms. So maybe we can start with a few of those uh, while people type up their questions. If there are any in the chat window, I will ask you, uh, uh, ask you to okay. answer them maybe. Yeah, so... One of the questions we had from one of our users in the feedback form was how to include teaching about microorganisms in a resource poor school and how to connect it to their curriculum. So I would say uh, the syllabus that you have for 11th grade students, um, I think something like that can be introduced uh, or, uh, you know, like a small chapter can be introduced to uh, in small grade, grade like eighth grade. Uh, I remember in eighth grade, we uh, had um, uh, information about uh, adaptation to environment and you had uh, uh, like plant pictures, mimosa, uh, which is like touch me not plant. And those kind of characters of plants, like how plants behave to a stimuli or even how our skin behaves to a stimuli. So maybe such a um, um, cartoon uh, or kind of like small, small processes that involve microbes can be introduced like like curdling of milk or something like um, uh, what what is the structure of a mushroom and what are the basic differences between uh, different groups of microorganisms can be introduced in eighth grade. Uh, do you have any specific questions like what do you want to study? No, so this was one of our users' uh, questions. So there's one related to what you just shared uh, from Thiru. He, mm -hmm. uh, they're asking what kind of a bead was used in the last experiment? Was it a glass bead? Okay. Uh, so microbes, they can attach to number of surfaces. We use plastic beads because they are, uh, uh, they are cost friendly. Uh, but of course, you can use glass beads, but plastic beads are easy to, f easy to find, um, uh, easy to produce, and uh, they are um, uh, cost-friendly. Uh, this plastic is a high-grade plastic, so it is not uh, something that you can use and throw. Uh, we can we reuse it, um, so it's also uh, eco-friendly in, in some case. Not very eco-friendly because it's still plastic, but yeah. Uh, so we have plastic beads, but you can also use glass beads. Uh, there is one question that I can see on the chat. Yeah. Which so, bacteria are considered infectious? What disease do they cause? So um, there are some bacteria. I can name them. They are like Salmonella, uh, Staphylococcus. They are considered infectious. So uh, bacterial infections are range from pimples on your skin or skin uh, scratches that you see, or sometimes when your wound gets infected when it's not covered properly or disinfected properly. So these are skin bacterial diseases. Uh, and you can see some things like Staph aureus in these diseases. Bacteria also form some respiratory diseases like uh, pneumonia. 
Uh, they also form ear infection or urinary tract infections. Um, they also form, uh, they also uh, give you dysentery. Uh, dysentery is mostly caused by amoeba, but they can be also caused by like cholera is bacterial disease. Um, uh, uh, even sometimes like loose motions are salmonella disease. So these are some bacteria that I can give names of, but then these are the diseases that you know and you hear about every now and then. Cholera, uh, dysentery, loose motions, <laughs> urinary tract infection, wound infections, acne, pimples. Uh, there's another question from Smita. She's asking, what are the other things that can be included in kitchen chemistry at school? Okay. Uh, so, uh, because of this um, curtailing of milk project, you can also introduce something like fermentation. So, how you make dosa batter, that could be introduced because that fermentation is also by yeast or microbes. Uh, something that we do every day in day to day life. Or, and also baking of cake or bread, uh, that can be introduced. What else? Um, Maybe people can observe the mold which which normally is discarded uh, on if, if it if it grows on bread. Um, I think there are very very little things that you can do without a microscope. So if a school can uh, have a microscope, then there are a lot of things that you can do. You can take samples from your teeth and see them uh, under the microscope. What kind of bacteria there are? What kind of microbes there are? How they move? Uh, something that you can't see with your naked eye. Uh, but other than that, uh, very limited things. But then I did discuss few things. Um, if you are interested what grows in your um, contaminated tea or contaminated food, of course, you can do this jelly thing and put the food uh, drops on, on that jelly and give it a day or two to grow in form of a colony. Okay. So we have uh, some students from Ahmedabad with us. Uh, mm -hmm. I'd encourage any of y'all, if y'all have uh, any questions that y'all want to ask uh, Ms. Isha, please go ahead and ask either in the chat or uh, I think there's one from one of the students. Uh, uh, she's asking, uh, in which case can bacteria, uh, sorry, in which case bacteria are considered as infectious other than causing infections or disease? So uh, bacteria are not considered infectious at primary level. So for example, what happens is when you get common cold, it is caused by a virus, but then your immune system gets very weak and then the bacteria that is already present as a, you know, like body microbe gets opportunity to cause disease when your uh, immunity gets weakened. So bacteria are considered infectious at secondary level. Um, I hope that answers your question. But normally uh, for uh, Indian immune system, um, I think uh, we are exposed to so many harmful bacteria in a way that our immune system is strong uh, to, to combat them. And therefore, most of the diseases you don't even see uh, I mean, you don't even feel it uh, in form of fever or any other uh, form of disease kind of uh, feeling because your immune system is strong enough to combat them at, uh, at every instant. Also, the body microbes help immune system to combat them. Uh, there was one more question. There was one question by uh, Preeti. Uh, uh, she has asked whether can all microorganisms be visible by magnifying glass, but I think you've already answered that. Uh, no. uh, only fungi and uh, algae can be observed by magnifying glass. But if you're interested, um, I think there are fold, uh, micro, foldable microscopes available. And I saw it on Amazon.in. But I don't know if other uh, places uh, sell those. And I think they are available by, like uh, in, uh, 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 so for rupees 500 to rupees 1000. Um, they are foldable microscope. The only thing is I've never used them. So I don't know how effective they are. But there are many articles on them where uh, the, uh, one, the person who invented them was uh, also Indian who uh, was in one of the American labs. She invented them. And they are now used uh, in some schools 
but I have never used them personally. So I don't know how effective they are, but uh, I think they should be effective because there are many articles that talk about them and that's available on amazon.in. Sure. Uh, Rohit is asking, uh, some say that bacteria are present in our hands. Is it harmful or good? So it's very hard to judge, right? So some bacteria are useful and therefore uh, you don't uh, always wash your hands with sanitation, sanitizer. So, you know, people now, nowadays use sanitize, uh, sanitizing agents. Uh, overuse of sanitization is not good because it wipes away also useful bacteria from your hands. But it's a good practice to wash your hands before you eat your food because uh, there could be some harmful bacteria on your hands. You don't know because you touch your hands everywhere, right? You can't monitor them. You can't monitor what you're touching is safe or not. And because you can't see them. So uh, yeah, there are both kinds of bacteria on your hand. Uh, so Sandeep is asking whether you could share some different types of microscopes, maybe names of different kinds of microscopes and what you yeah. can do. Uh, so there is light microscope, which is the simplest form of microscope. Uh, it has different ranges of magnification. So you can uh, enlarge or zoom with using different lenses, just like any other camera. Uh, then there, are, there is, so for example, viruses, you can't use a light microscope to visualize viruses. So there is this huge setup of microscope called as electron microscope that is used to visualize viruses. And electron microscope is also used to visualize certain other structures, minute, very minute protein structures on bacterial surfaces or any other cellular surfaces. Even on our cells, sometimes cancers, uh, cancer cells need these microscopes to visualize them properly, like how are they uh, growing and everything. So there is electron microscope. Then there is... Um, there are atomic force microscope that use atomic energy in order to make structures or images. This is kind of thing that is also used in telescope to make images of uh, some things that are very far away from you. So something that are very minute, you use atoms, you just pass, you just put uh, atoms on the, on the samples and that atoms uh, create an image and something that even telescopes use. So that is atomic, atomic force microscope. So these are few microscopes that are used. Um, not every microbiologist have used it. I've never used an atomic force microscope, for example, but I've used electron uh, microscope to visualize viruses. And yeah, so as a microbiologist, if you study a particular microbe, you get chance to use these microscopes. Right. Uh, also, Pratham is asking, what types of bacteria are present in air? I can't, there are so many, there are so many bacterial species. Some of them are not even discovered so far. So, I mean, there are many types of bacteria in air. Some bacteria that cause respiratory diseases are also present in air. But at the same time, you have lots and lots of bacteria because bacteria are so light that they can stay in air. Like they can float in air, just like we can float in water. Uh, at the same time, you have spores present in air. Spores are the seeds uh, from fun fungus. And these, uh, therefore, when you keep your bread exposed or if you have some food exposed, you can easily see spores uh, germinating on them in a few days. Right. Uh, Preeti, you were raising your hand. Is there something you wanted to say? Preeti? Okay, maybe we'll move on to the next question. So, uh, R.G. has asked whether the algae and fungi collected from different places will have the same composition if observed by a magnifying lens. So, basic structures are same. Like algae will have a chlorophyll. It will have a uh, genetic material containing organ, which is called as nucleus. It is also present in our cells. Uh, it will have mitochondria. Uh, so these few organ or organelles or cellular uh, uh, components will be same in all the algae. But then structurally, they could be different. Like the way things are arranged could be different in these microorganisms. Similarly, in fungi also, you have 
so so every every fungi can emit certain um, pigments right so even in mushrooms sometimes you see yellow mushrooms you see uh, white mushrooms sometimes you see like hitachi mushrooms are brown mushrooms so you know there are like different structures just like plants you or not all plants are same so the way they grow they grow uh, non uniformly and so the structural difference might be present but the essential components of cells do remain the same like every fungi has a stalk and a body and uh, it has spores uh, it has uh, genetic material it has mitochondria even algae has mitochondria so the essential components do remain same uh rohit is asking can we consume bacteria that doesn't cause any harm to us of course and you do con consume it uh in form of curd you do consume bacteria then there are lots of probiotics one thing that i know is kajol advertises for this probiotic called as yakul so this probiotic has bacteria healthy bacteria that so so what happens is sometimes some people do not have healthy bacteria in their guts so in order for that people uh, doctors ask them to take probiotics in order to change the gut environment and this probiotics help you um uh, grew, uh like have your gut with like fill your gut with healthy bacteria so of course you can consume bacteria and you do consume bacteria knowingly or unknowingly and that's how you get infections right you get salmonella infections or dysentery or vibrio cholerae by uh, uh consuming contaminant water but not all bacteria are bad sometimes your body helps you fight lots of harmful bacteria and therefore you don't even know if you have any disease or not Uh, so we have an interesting question gopinathan is asking if the bacteria present in humans and animals are the same no uh, so this is something called as microbiome and people are going studying like how microbiomes are different in different things so uh, your human microbiome is different than animal microbiome uh because of the surroundings that how we keep ourselves we have a bed to sleep whereas uh, animals have uh, more uh, natural environments where they are and also they consume lots of uh, different types of food than us also there are there is this big study being done on people living in villages their microbiome versus people living in urban societies their microbiome how different that is so even people living in different two different surroundings might have different microbiome going on their skin hair gut everywhere so there are also different studies being done that people who have pets they have different microorganisms and sometimes the pet microorganism the animal microbiome and human microbiome is shared when you have pet living in close proximity so of course the microbiome or what kind of composition is your bacteria is a whole new range of study and it's quite interesting and you can answer a lot of lifestyle questions depend uh, when when you uh, see what kind of microbiome shapes you right akshata is asking any books describing experiments for kids based on microbes that you could suggest uh -huh. i'm really sorry akshata i am not aware of these books um uh, right now uh, because i have never read them uh but there is this one book uh that uh, i would like you to read because it is for not for kids but kind of for public who doesn't know anything about microbiology it is written by ed young it is a quite popular book it is called i contain multitudes it actually talks about how um microbes are part of you i will write here i Yeah, type it out. In the, can you just type the uh, uh, spell the author thing out? Uh, Ed Young. Ed Young. Okay, great. Okay, and uh, the, but I don't know if this book has experiments for kids. Uh, I'm sorry, I am not sure if there are any books uh, that I can refer to right now. Maybe you should if, if yeah, sorry. If you do come across some, maybe you can email it to our guests because we have all of them on. Uh, our mailing list and we okay. could just like uh, suggest it in the email follow up email that we send them sure so sure yeah that right uh 
also we have shared prerna has shared isha's email id uh, in the chat uh, it's isha@matre@gmail.com you all could directly interact with her if you all need to uh, we have about two more minutes uh, for the questions to go on uh, i'm going to ask one more question uh, that is by thiru uh, he uh, he or she sorry i, I can't tell uh has asked whether the dilute hydrochloric acid dil let's say i'm assuming that's dilute hydrochloric acid mm -hmm. in our stomach uh kill the bacteria that we consume uh you will be surprised bacteria can live in extreme conditions so they don't kill like lot of uh, i think they will kill your uh, gut cells more than killing bacteria uh so no uh what the acidic environment that we produce uh, is harmful for our gut but is not harmful for the bacteria so much there there are acidic bacteria that can consume the acid that start thriving afterwards but yes antibiotics if you take antibiotics they are harmful for bacteria um i like this particular question and i think we can take that what is the average lifetime of a bacteria so bacteria you you can't know what is the lifetime of a bacteria because it keeps dividing so one cell divides and it forms two daughter cells and so that particular culture goes on dividing and it goes on dividing until and unless you stop giving it nutrients and so it could be days to months uh um, but average lifetime of a cell to divide is either 20 minutes to a day for a microorganism so in in a day or in 20 minutes or in a day they can divide and form daughter cells so isha i just have a follow up question to that so what what is there a way to measure the lifespan of the the parent cell from which the whole like is there a specific okay. lifespan that that has yeah, yeah. so uh, for example if you see a or uh, easy bacteria like a lactic acid bacteria that grows in your curd it can divide in 20 minutes so what people do is they when they divide there is one part of the bacteria so for example just consider this as a bacterial cell when it divides it becomes two right so this is a old pole and what is formed here is a new pole so there are studies done on how to measure the old pole and how how longer does the old pole survive so there are these few techniques that scientists study in order to know which how how long does the 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 contents from the original bacteria survive but you can also monitor it by time lapse microscopy that how fast one single cell is dividing into two there are lots of videos that you can find on youtube about dividing bacterial cells just go and look at them and they are beautiful as well okay great thanks so much isha uh, guys uh, there's loads more questions which have come in the chat uh, but we unfortunately uh, i have run out of time uh, what i would uh, encourage all of you all to do is maybe directly uh, write to isha or you all can write to contact fitki and we can convey the questions to isha uh, uh, that you all might be having there's loads of more questions which we haven't yet uh, been able to answer uh so the contact with the id is basically contact with the at each for india dot org uh which has been shared in your chat you all can write to that id or you all can write to isha with your questions and she could answer them when uh as possible uh so we'd like to thank you so much isha for your time and your expertise uh today can you please quickly share your thoughts about today's webinar me yeah <laughs> i really like the kind of questions that are coming up and i would be really glad to introduce microbiology at school level so uh, if there are any educators or uh, teachers who would like to implement that even at the practical level not at the theory level um please write to me i would i would assist you guys in any way possible and i'm really happy about the turnout and the kind of questions are, that are asked we uh, we scientists really like to, uh, to to tell public about uh what we do and more people understand microbes more uh, i think we can reveal what kind of uh, new information we have about them and also the life on this particular planet 
So it's nice that people are interested in microbes and I want more and more people to interest, get interest in microbes because they are very sensual. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Isha. Thank you everyone for joining in. Our next webinar is scheduled to take place on the 13th of September uh, with the British Council on Assessment Literacy. So keep looking for the Firki emails in your inboxes for information on this upcoming webinar. Uh, also, before you guys leave, please take uh, a minute to give us feedback on your learning experience on the webinar today. This will help us grow and improve our resources for you. Thank you once again, uh, all of you for joining and thank you, Isha, for conducting the webinar. Uh, have a good evening, all of you. Thanks. Bye. Right, bye.